bit of footage I'm going to share with you is a, um, a, a drone flight um, over a, a, an open cage salmon farm based in Loch Fyne on the west coast of Scotland. Um, Scotland has roughly 300 licensed salmon farms, open cage salmon farms. Um, at any one time, um, approximately 150 of them will be active and they range from the most southern kind of western tip of Scotland down near Campbelltown um, and all the way up to the northernmost tip um, up in Shetland um, and Orkney. Um, so we have essentially a, a curtain of salmon farms, roughly one every 10 or 20 miles um, as you travel up the west coast of Scotland. But this is just one of them. Um, so I'll show you what it looks like from the air. Fingers crossed the, uh, the technology works. So you shouldn't hear any audio other than me, um, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, a pretty standard open cage salmon farm for Scotland. Um, the round circles uh, in the water are the individual cages, um, and salmon farms vary in size now from 10 cages all the way up to, to 12 um, or 13, uh, or 14, 15, even bigger nowadays. Th this is an individual cage. Um, and just to explain a little bit about what's going on here, um, in each one of these um, cages, um, they could be anything up to 30 or 40,000 uh, farmed salmon. The cages are actually pretty simple uh, in construction. You have around the perimeter um, a black plastic floating platform, um, and then suspended from that is a net um, which uh, goes down through the water to about um, anything down to about 20, 20 or 30 metres uh, in a cone shape right down to the bottom. Um, and the fish are contained within that net, but the net is um, uh, just a, a standard permeable net with about one inch square netting. Um, and the water flows in and out of those nets um, and in and out of the cages as the tide, um, as the tide moves in and out. Um, and that creates current for the fish to swim against and moves them around the, the cage. Um, but um, the, the main reason open cage salmon farmers like uh, a high current is to wash the, the waste in and out of the salmon farms to keep a, a clean supply of water or relatively clean. So, so what you're seeing here is uh, the, the fish inside one, one pen being treated for sea lice. Um, and sea lice are a parasite that occurs naturally um, in the environment. Um, it's a, a small, um, tiny little um, parasite that attaches itself to fish um, and eats their, their mucous membrane and the, the upper layers of their skin. Um, and fish, uh, in a, in normally in a, in, a, in a natural setting, fish will have one or two sea lice on them, um, and uh, they're not really a problem. But inside a pen where um, you've got very high density of salmon um, and they've got nowhere to go, the parasites have a very, very uh, large number of hosts um, on which to attach themselves, a very large surface area. And so the populations of those parasites explode inside these salmon farms um, to the extent that some fish will be covered in hundreds and hundreds of parasites and left unchecked um, those parasites will consume the salmon uh, and they'll eat the skin. They won't kill them but they, they will subject them to a very high degree of stress which I'll show you later on. And from the salmon farmer's perspective that affects the growth rates um, of the fish inside the pen um, so uh, they, they like to treat them to reduce the parasite loading and um, to improve the growth potential of the fish and that's what's happening here. This is a, a process which is called um, hydrolysing, which is intended to replace the use of chemical baths, um, which have been used traditionally, but the, the chemicals that farmers traditionally used on salmon farms um, are being increasingly tightly regulated because of the damage they do to the environment. Um, so hydrolysing is actually a very simple process. Um, you can see uh, here uh, in the top left-hand corner of the pen inside the orange rope, that's where all the fish um, from this pen have been crowded, is the term they call it, and um, where 20, 30, 40,000 fish, uh, fish are squeezed up against the, the side of the, the pen. And then these black pipes, uh, which are leaving the pen, they suck the fish up into this vessel where they travel along a series of pipes that contain brushes um, and water jets that physically remove 
Um, usually about 90%, 95% of the sea lice from the fish's body. Um, the fish are then ejected down what's called a dewaterer, down this slide and then back into the pen. Um, and you can see in the lower area here, this small boat, that's where some of the fish are being sampled um, uh, to check that uh, lice has been removed. The annotation there referred to hydrogen peroxide. So what you see here, these two large tankers on this vessel are hydrogen peroxide, which is one of the chemical treatments that's used to remove sea lice from the fish. Um, in this case, the hydrogen peroxide is not being deployed. Although there's blue pipes going into the water, that's actually uh, oxygen that's going in to, um, to ensure these fish uh, have enough oxygen to survive the treatment. Um, and hydrolysing will be done um, uh, not really much more than, than two or three times in a cycle because of the, the impact it has on fish health and welfare. Um, and we're just doing a finishing the fly over here, um, looking at the farm and the, the treatment still ongoing. But all of these pens would be treated um, uh, once or twice, uh, particularly in the run-up to the, um, the fish being harvested. Okay, so let me just get back to where I am. Okay, so that's that's hydrolysing um, and um, uh, a fly over the salmon farm. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that, about what they saw there, or whether you just want me to move straight on to the next clip. If anyone has any questions, just pop them in the chat. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on to um, a video sequence which shows you what life is like inside a salmon farm. Um, and this was a piece of footage I shot uh, two years ago now. Um, oh, sorry, there's a question come in about the, does, it, does hydrolysing harm the fish? Um, the answer to that question is yes. Um, hydrolysing is something that's only deployed on larger fish um, it, uh, the smaller fish can't take it, um, can't, can't take travelling along the pipes um, or the, the, the physical pressure of the, the brushes on the, um, the jets. It, it does harm the fish and it's been one of the biggest issues that's affected the, the salmon farming industry in the last couple of years um, because they, they, they thought this was a silver bullet in terms of dealing with the, the unnatural level of parasites in salmon farms. Um, but what's uh, turned out to be the case is that um, hydrolysing um, certainly over the last couple of years does have quite a substantial knock-on effect on the physical health of the fish. Um, it can affect the, the swim bladders um, and it does stress the fish. So it, it, it's, it's not lethal at uh, the point at which it's done, although salmon farmers usually do find that they suffer about 1% mortality every time they, they hydrolyse their stock. Um, but the, the knock-on effects of reducing the uh, or certainly stressing the fish um, has has resulted in higher levels of um, secondary infections taking place and um, so that's where you see things like amoebic gill disease becoming a more of a problem than it, it might necessarily be um, and certainly there was last year there were certain areas certain farms where hundreds of thousands of fish were um, very badly affected because their swim bladders um, were uh, were affected and damaged during the hydrolysing process so it does harm the fish, but not in a in a very not in a in a direct and very obvious way at the time. Um, the the second bit of footage I'm going to show here is it shows you what life is like inside a salmon farm. Um, this was a salmon farm which I investigated two years ago, um, and ultimately led to um, coverage on uh, national coverage on um, the BBC, a number of BBC uh, programs, including the. The, the primetime show, BBC, the BBC One show, um, uh, and it also led to a panorama investigation of the industry as well. This was a, a salmon farm that was experiencing very high parasite levels, but by no means was it unique, um, and by no means is it the highest levels of parasites that, that have been recorded on salmon farms. But this shows you um, what it looks like inside a salmon farm when there's a, a relatively severe parasite outbreak. Um, so hopefully, I think, can you see the whole screen clearly? Is that okay? So 
So this clip lasts about three minutes. Um, what you can see here, this is a, these are fish inside the farm um, uh, and I'm filming underwater. Um, these are fish that have been very badly affected by parasit parasitization um, from sea lice. Um, and there's been a, uh, an explosion of sea lice on the farm and the fish um, uh, have been infected with these parasites for a long time and they've been untreated or unsuccessfully treated for a number of weeks. Um, so footage that I showed to uh, other farm managers, other salmon farm managers, um, I showed this footage to them and asked them about it. They said it would take about three weeks for um, salmon, mature salmon, to get into this state. And what you see on this fish here in this frame, hopefully quite clearly, you can see the parasites on the skin, these little brown dots with the white, with the white tails. Those are mature female sea lice. Um, there will be a whole lot of other life stages on the fish, which are the smaller males um, and um, the, the, uh, the more juvenile stages. The white areas are where the, the sea lice have consumed the mucous membrane and the upper layers of skin um, and working their way down to flesh. Um, and you'll see that more commonly the parasites um, start at the, the head of the fish and then gradually they'll work their way back. Um, but as I say, it takes about three weeks um, of being left untreated um, for, this, for, this, uh, for fish to get into this state. Um, and if you look carefully in this footage, what you're looking for are, are white heads um, or um, um, white, um, white damage to the fish. Um, uh, the footage is pretty clear considering it's underwater, but virtually every single fish in the frame at any stage um, is suffering a similar level of damage. Um, I'll just, I'll let that roll for a while. It, uh, it, it, it was a pretty unpleasant experience filming it, I have to say. Um, it, it had been rumoured for a long time that fish were like this in salmon farms, but this is the first time anywhere in the world that anyone had actually filmed it um, inside the cages and when, in this level of detail. Um, and I, I went to the salmon farm genuinely not expecting to see something like this. And when I filmed it, I, I have to say, I've seen some pretty horrible sights in my life, but, um, and I come from a, a, a farming, um, and a, a livestock farming background. And I, I, was, um, I was, was, was pretty shocked when I saw it. And, and it was pretty upsetting to see uh, the numbers of fish in this state and the fact that they've been left in this state for so long and that nothing was happening. You can see obviously some very, very severely damaged fish there. Um, I filmed on site for a, a long time um, and I have hours of footage um, and every fish you see, um, so you can see there are fish with, with white heads and very severe damage. Um, when you see the, the original footage, it was shot in 4K, like these passing fish don't have the white heads, but you can see the, um, I'll just roll it back a little bit. As these fish pass, you can see the white scarring down their back, and that's the that's the start of, or that is damage from parasites. They're just a, they're not quite as far on as some of these fish. You'll also see fish jumping um, uh, a lot in the water surface and shaking their head, and that is a response to to the sea lice. And um, often, uh, when people are taken to visit salmon farms, jumping fish are are held out as being a sign of um, the vitality of the fish. Um, uh, and look at them jumping because people there's traditionally people associate um, leaping wild salmon with uh, with all things that are good about wild fish and um, but these fish jump because they're parasitized and stressed and they don't jump because they're because they're happy and they're wild so this this poor guy here is in a terrible state he's been eaten to bits um, and uh, you know my feeling was that that these fish should have been euthanized um, uh, and euthanized quickly, but they obviously hadn't been um, and they weren't, which was uh, pretty concerning. A couple of questions there, Corin. That was really difficult to watch. Um, 
So we'll start off with from Julio. Hi Julio. Um, he's saying if fish density inside the pens invites parasitism, which in turn incre increases mortality and reduces yield, wouldn't it make sense to reduce fish density? Have you come across any salmon farmer that considered this as an option? Um, salmon farmers do consider fish density. Um, they don't really can the, the issue of 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 sea lice and parasitization is is not something that they really manage density for they, they manage density for other reasons to do with waste output and being compliant for environmental impacts sea lice is a it, it's a pretty um it's a pretty invidious problem because sea lice those fish as you see they can be severely damaged but it doesn't kill them um, so you, those fish still have a value, they still have a commercial value um, and the losses that the salmon farmer or the, the opportunity costs of reducing the density in the, in the pen would, um, would, uh, are, are not offset by um, the, the value of keeping your fish in good health because you, you can still yield some money for those fish that are very heavily parasitized um, and they do. I don't know exactly where those fish went. And that was a part of the investigation that I couldn't get at. But certainly at the time, there was a leading supermarket that was being uh, that had its salmon as being labelled coming from that farm. Um, now, when that issue was raised with the producer and with the supermarket, they said, well, we have very strict grading policies and those fish would not have entered the food chain. But um, that is uh, it's not something which is independently verified. And frankly, it's not something that that stands up to the testimony of individuals who worked in the fish press, the fish processing plant in Stornoway um, who saw no separation um, or grading on that basis. So because sea lice don't kill the salmon, they're, they're generally something that this, the salmon farmers are quite happy for the fish um, to, to endure, particularly in the last few weeks, in the last couple of months in the run up to harvest, um, the commercial impact of having high sea lice levels in the salmon farm is virtually negligible. So um, the salmon farmers don't really take any significant action to manage them. Okay, um, it's very interesting. I, I think you've partially answered the next question there as well, Corin from Anne, um, who's asking, would the fish with parasites be eaten and what is the effect on human health of those eating the fish? Um, the, so uh, the, 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 the um, the the answer is that yes fish with sea lice parasites are sold and they are eaten um, i've actually found um fish for sale in supermarkets on the fish counter with parasites on them um, obviously not at that level because they the during the 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 filleting process and the processing plants they remove a lot of those parasites they're washed off um, and that's the, the hydrolysing that you saw there um the hydrolysing that you saw there is actually sometimes done um, towards the end of the harvest simply to clean the lice off the fish before the fish are harvested and taken to market. That's the purpose it serves. Um, so it's really just an aesthetic thing. Um, but, it, you know, the parasites themselves won't directly have an impact on human health. They're not, they're not dangerous to humans at all. Thank you. Um... So another question, which I don't know if you want to answer, Corin. Um, did you have permission to film this, or was it all carried out undercover? No, I didn't have permission to film it. I've, I've never had permission to film anything. I don't. There's no. There's no legal requirement for me to have permission to film it. Um, and uh, anyone is perfectly entitled um, to to access the water in and around salmon farms. Um, you, if you're asked to leave, if you're on the structure and you're asked to remove yourself from the structure, then you should do. Um, but you're absolutely there is there's nothing which stops you legally from being in the water in and around salmon farms and filming what's going on there um, uh, filming inside the cages brings with it um, a substantial amount of technical challenges um, and safety issues and um, the, the single biggest issue from a safety perspective that I worry about because um, the way I access farms is by swimming to them um, with my gear and I drag it behind me um, is that um, I worry about being mistaken for a seal and being shot. Um, and I say that flippantly, but that, that is my biggest single concern um, when, I'm, when I'm out filming. Um, because a guy in a wetsuit swimming on the surface can look like a seal. But, um, um, but yeah, and filming inside the salmon farms is not something I'd recommend. It is, it is, it is, 
fraught with all sorts of safety issues. There's a lot of mooring ropes there. Um, there's a lot of activity going on. These are big industrial sites um, and it is quite risky. But um, uh, yeah, certainly there's nothing, there's no uh, issues of legality concerned with the filming. And I, 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 I do it a lot and I, I still plan to do it a lot more. Mm, that's, that's amazing. That must be so frightening. I didn't even think that you might get mistaken as a seal. That's what a terrifying prospect. Um, well, thankfully, now that the, the shooting of seals has been banned, um, mm. um, that's, that, that's less of an issue. But yeah, it, it is. That's why a lot of the time I'd swim out to the, the farms uh, in the dark um, and get there in the dark and film at first light so that um, there wasn't the opportunity for that kind of thing to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then we've got another question from Sam from this afternoon. Hi, Sam. Uh, do you know if this farm holds itself out as SSPO compliant or RSPCA assured? So the SSPO is the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation, um, which is basically a, like a, a lobbying group for the industry. Um, and the company that was running that farm, the Scottish Salmon Company, they are a member of that organisation. Um, but that organisation, as I say, it's a lobby group. It it, it doesn't um, it it doesn't uh, uh, have any standards associated with welfare or anything like that. Oh, sorry, um, Corin, I just interrupt. Um, Sam, he said he meant the COGP. Oh, the Code of Good Practice. Um, um, it, the Code of Good Practice is a um, is essentially a, a a voluntary standards document that the industry. Um, said it would operate to um, in terms of the sea lice levels that uh, that the code of good practice suggests should be present on salmon farms they are um, 1.0 average so that's the number of of adult and um, female uh, sea lice that should be present on the fish on average um, for most of the year um, and for a short period um, march to july when wild fish are migrating past the farms it should be lower than that at 0 0.5 the industry has um, essentially abandoned those levels that they set for themselves as best practice. Um, so the, 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 um, the, the sea lice level on that farm was um, from memory, uh, was from memory was just over 22 um, sea lice. Uh, sorry, no, sorry. It, the, yeah, the, 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 the average sea lice level on that farm at the time I filmed was 13.38. Um, and female sea lice per fish. And um, so um, 13 times what the, the best practice industry standard was. Um, and in a subsequent investigation that I did into the company's operations in that area, because they had another um, six salmon farms running at the time, and um, the highest sea lice level I found there was 22. And um, so that is way, way over the, the um, industry's best practice. Um, but the industry has sadly essentially abandoned the levels that it set it for themselves. So the sea lice levels are higher than that now. So no, it wasn't compliant. Um, sorry, I can see the question from Tiffany about the percentage of salmon that comes from these farms. So if you're buying the salmon that's on sale in supermarkets, the bright orange stuff with the white banding, 99.9% um, .9 of it will be farm salmon from open cage salmon farms. You will occasionally see salmon that is labeled wild salmon or wild Alaskan salmon that comes from wild fisheries, line caught salmon on the, um, from the Pacific coast in, uh, in America, um, but the, the vast majority, 99.999% of salmon, the bright orange fish that is sold in the UK, is um, open cage salmon that comes from farms exactly like this. Mm, that's very worrying. Um, thank you for answering those questions, Corin. Um, we've just got one more. I think we'll take that one and then we'll move straight on. Um, so this is from Andy, not the Hulk. Um, why, with known environmental and welfare concerns, have open cage salmon fish farms been allowed to expand in Scotland by the Scottish Government, ignoring expert independent advice, particularly so with the proposed pesticides that are not allowed to be used on land? Um, so the um, open cage salmon farming is um, is given um, a, has a huge amount of political support from the, the current Scottish government and to be fair has had a lot of support um, from previous um, governments in Scotland or people that were governing Scotland as well and um, the reason it, it, it has so much support is um, primarily because it has a large export value so over 600 million pounds worth of salmon is sold um, overseas each year 
Um, uh, and that figure is very useful um, for the Scotland's annual GDP results. Um, so that is the main reason that it gets um, political cover. Um, the, the, reason, the other reason that the Scottish Government will often hold out is that salmon farming um, uh, provides jobs in remote rural communities, um, particularly coastal communities that are desperate for jobs. Um, that is true in one or two locations, um, particularly in um, particularly in, in Orkney. Um, there are areas where salmon farming does employ um, a substantial proportion of the population. But um, overall, throughout the west coast of Scotland, where there are um, over 250,000 active individuals, employed individuals, salmon farming employs just 1,400 people. Um, uh, and in 1996, it employed 1,200 people. Um, so it, the uh, the employment that the industry offers has has grown very little in the last um, in the last decades. Um, meanwhile, its environmental impact has has increased dramatically. Um, and um, those jobs have not come without cost. So there's very strong anecdotal evidence that for every one job that has been created on a salmon farm, um, upwards of three or four may have been lost. Um, by industries that are reliant on um, abundant biodiversity, which open cage salmon farming wipes out as a result of its pollution. Um, those are industries like the recreational fisheries industry, inshore commercial fisheries industries, um, uh, and the opportunity cost, the lack of tourism um, and inability to expand because you've got huge industrial units in areas where, um, uh, where you should have abundant wildlife. Okay, perfect. Um... Okay, I'll hop on to the next bit of yep. footage if you like. Perfect. Um, let me just see what I was going to share. Um, oh yeah, I'll, I'll show this very quickly. Um, this was uh, a piece. This was a, a photograph I took um, when I was on the, when I was doing the investigation into this salmon farm where I filmed the, the underwater footage. Um, I'd completed my filming and I was sitting at the end of a road um, in uh, the Isle of Lewis in the Hebrides. Um, and one of the big issues that's associated with salmon farming is, is mortalities or fish dying on salmon farms. And they die in their hundreds of thousands um, and many, many tons. Um, so this particular area, as I said, there were six salmon farms running and they all had similar levels of issues. Um, so there were hundreds of tons of fish dying on these salmon farms that had to be transported away. And they're transported away in large, very obvious trucks. Um, and I was sitting at the end of a road in Lewis um, and one of these trucks came past me and there's only really one way off Lewis when you're, when you're carrying tons of dead fish um, and that's the ferry uh, in Stornoway. But this lorry didn't turn and didn't take the turning for the ferry in Stornoway and actually turned right and headed south, um, which was a very peculiar thing to do. So I decided to follow it and see where it was going and that led me on a, a trail um, across a number of the, the small islands um, to Harris, to Burnera and eventually to North Uist. Um, across a number of ferries um, and I continued to follow this vehicle um, all the way to a remote site in North Uist where it transpired um, uh, these dead fish were being dumped in an open air pit um, in North Uist which is an activity which is illegal um, but the Scottish Government had given this site um, a derogation um, to, um, to conduct this activity. Um, so the, it, it's not illegal on this site but it is illegal if, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, once I discovered that, I returned to the site to do some undercover photography there or um, when no one else was there. And, and this, is, this is the image that I shot, um, which has become one of the kind of iconic images of, of the waste of, of salmon farming. So... So what you're looking at in this image um, is an open air pit at a site where there's fish being dumped in this manner for many, many years. Um, this pit represents about three um, lorry loads or maybe four lorry, lorry loads, about at, at most 100 tonnes of, of fish, uh, of dead salmon that had died um, on one of these salmon farms. Um, and just to put that in context, that's 100 tonnes out of, um, in 2019, uh, 26,000 tonnes um, of salmon that died on salmon farms across Scotland prematurely. Uh, 
Um, I will share with you um, one last little bit of footage if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I've actually got quite a bit more, but I'm just conscious of, of time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'll just, I'll share this film um, and I'll explain a little bit about what's... My name's Corey Smith, I'm here in Scotland. I don't want to hear me talking. Um, so, this is a, another farm in Loch Fyne. Um, this is a, a farm which salmon farms are their their size and scale is denoted by the the licensed biomass which is permitted on the site. And um, so this is a one thousand five hundred ton biomass salmon farm, um, which is about average, just above average now for the industry. Um, but we are now seeing salmon farms up to seven thousand tons uh, in Scotland, and um, the farms are getting bigger and bigger, um, basically because. Um, salmon farms find it very difficult to get new planning consents for more surface area, so more farms in other locations. So they are increasing the size of the salmon farms in the existing locations. Um, and unfortunately, that's being aided and abetted by SEPA, um, who actually rated a large number of these salmon farms as um, unsatisfactory for their environmental impact, um, but then realised that was preventing the expansion of the industry, so have subsequently gone away and um, uh, basically change the standard so that farms that were unsatisfactory are now satisfactory and can can expand. Uh, so what you're seeing in each one of these pens, you'll see the fish splashing away um, as, uh, as the drone flies over. And remember what I said before that the, the fish splashing is not a sign of vitality and happiness. That is generally a, a sign of, um, of stress. Um, the boat at the end here is actually involved in harvesting, so it looks like hydrolysing, but the fish um, are just being sucked into the, the well of the boat where they'll then be transported to a processor. Um, these farms are inspected um, pretty rarely, um, so once every three years or so they may get a, get a full inspection. Um, so that's one of the reasons I go and swim to the farms and see what's going on, is just that in those intervening periods, quite a lot of things happen um, that, that maybe shouldn't. Um, so this is me during the day swimming out to, to one of these farms. Um, as you can see from a long distance, I could quite easily be mistaken for a seal. Um, but um, it takes a little bit of time, but eventually you get there. That day, um, I wasn't really filming anything other than um, I wanted to look at the water quality because um, it was a, a farm that was right at the end of its cycle. So you can see here, um, this is what the water quality is like in and around farms. So all this debris um, and detritus in the water is, is feed excrement and bits of rotting fish as the fish break down when they, when they die in the, in the farm. Um, and that's not something you see when you're away from farms. The west coast of Scotland is famed for its water clarity. Um, uh, and so that's one of the, the major environmental issues is just what I describe as the salmon farm sewage that's emitted direct into um, our marine ecosystems. Mm, that's fascinating. Um, I, th I think we'll just take, um, are you finished with the footage, Corin? Sh sure, yeah. Um, we'll just take a question that we had before of Steve. Um, so Steve was wondering, um, What are the main ways these farms could be improved for welfare in particular, but also for the environment? And Steve also said, also, if RSPCA assured is not significantly higher in standards, is there any way of buying higher standard Scottish salmon or what is the highest standard in your opinion? Um, well, I'll take the environmental question first. Um, so there are a, there's two main environmental impacts that the salmon farms have. One is their impact on biodiversity um, and they impact biodiversity by two main actions. One is the emission of un, uh, highly elevated unnatural levels of um, parasites that are, um, that are incubated and propagated on the salmon farms and then emitted into the environment in, in vast quantities by orders of hundreds if not thousands more than would occur naturally. Um, and wild fish populations, a variety of wild fish species, um, are exposed to those parasites um, at levels which they ordinarily wouldn't be, and obviously that has a, a significant impact on them and their welfare. Um, those lice have 
lethal impacts on juvenile fish, um, but probably the, the biggest issue is the sublethal impacts, the reductions um, in fish uh, health, wild fish health and well-being that will ultimately reduce their resistance to naturally occurring diseases and reduce their ability to breed successfully. Um, so sea lice are one of the major environmental issues. Um, and the second major environmental issue is, the, is a pollution and a degradation of the environment, which is associated with the emission of huge amounts of organic waste from the farm. So salmon farm sewage. Um, the 150 active salmon farms in terms of fish farm crap, um, essentially, um, they produce as much organic waste as about two and a half million people. Um, and that is just emitted direct into the surrounding water column where it's suspended um, and gradually sinks to the seafloor um, where, it, where it rests, basically. Um, there's also a large amount of chemical pollution uh, associated with medicinal treatments for sea lice, um, and those chemicals affect um, crustacea like lobster, crab, shrimp, etc., um, as, as well as other things. Um, and then there's other sort of industrial um, associated pollution like large particle uh, and small particle plastic pollution that comes from um, the structures as well as everything you'd expect from heavy industry like um, big boat traffic and that kind of stuff. So th there's a lot that could be done to reduce the environmental impact um, um, in, in terms of stopping using chemicals, collecting and removing or preventing the emissions of organic waste. Um, and dramatically reducing, requiring salmon farmers to dramatically reduce the sea lice levels on their on their farms. Um, but it is very difficult to see how um, these hyper industrial units um, could ever be considered environmentally friendly or sustainable. You, you'd really be mitigating and, and reducing the problems um, as, as much as you could. Um, and I often describe it as putting a tip on a on a cigarette you know you can put a filter on a cigarette and make it slightly less damaging to to your health but it's still a cigarette at the end of the day um in terms of the welfare issues um there is it is probably one of the most intensive hyper intensive forms of of animal production which is why i describe it describe them as feedlots um there is there is really no way to to make that environment uh uh, what I would describe as a as a as a high welfare environment. You know, it is it is impossible. You know, people may choose to consume the fish on the basis of it being um, you know an industrially produced fish, but that is the basis on which they should consume it. It should never really be considered a a high welfare product in the same way that you could never consider um, intensively battery reared um, chickens uh, and eggs. Um, a high welfare product. If you want, you know, it's just impossible for it to be a high welfare product, and um, with that form of with that form of farming. Um. Thank you, Corin. That's that's great. Very um, informative response. And um, we have a great question from Julio again here. Um, how can that amount of decomposing organic matter left in the open not create a public health concern? Also, is that open pit equipped with any lining to prevent leakage of nutrients from the fish into the surrounding soil structure? Um, so it, it does create a public health concern, um, particularly indirectly, which is one of the reasons that, that these, this form of um, um, disposal has been banned in, in Europe or across Europe. Um, and it's, you know, it's the reason that, that livestock farmers are no longer allowed to, to dig a hole in their farm and dump their dead sheep and cattle in it. Um, because the the direct public health concern um, is is probably less so. It's the indirect public health concern um, that's the biggest risk, which is um, other animals having access to those decomposing animals, and particularly ones that come from a hyper intensive um, uh, production process with a high prevalence of disease. Um, is the risk of transmission of disease from uh, well intraspecies transmission um, um, from fish to bird um, or bird uh, from fish to um, other carrion um, consuming animals like foxes or anything like that and what that you know the other impacts that may have um, you, you know we've I think it's pretty well documented some of the issues in terms of the risks associated with disease transmission um, from species to species um, in terms of the 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 lining um, of these burial pits, um, 
they're they're not lined at all. They're just they're they're sand um, sand and lime pits, um, and then they're filled in. So there's nothing to stop um, leakage into the the surrounding soil structure. And those pits themselves are actually less than fifty meters from um, um, fifty meters from the the shoreline of a a, a, a banking that's been eroded. Um, and as I say, on that site, there are probably hundreds of burial pits from from tens and twen tens of years. Um, so it's it's inevitable that eventually those those pits will be exposed to um, to the wider environment again. Well, that's shocking. Yeah. Um, thank you for answering that, Corin. Um, we've got a question from Sue. Uh, oh no! First, we have Robert um, saying, "Could you quickly outline the issue of cleaner fish?" Sure. Um, I'll jump back in and explain that. I've got a, I've got a picture of that. Um, that'll make a bit more sense. Uh, or maybe let me just see if I can see it. Oh, um, just give me a second. I'll open. No worry. You're not pushed for time, Corin. So don't worry. Ah, okay. Um, I'll just open up this footage again um, and show you what a cleaner fish is. Um, okay, so uh, this little guy here down um, bottom right of the fish's jaw, um, hopefully you guys can see that. That is a cleaner fish. He is a, is a lump fish that's been put in the salmon farm. Um, and the idea is that these little guys feed in the wild, they feed on um, sea lice uh, and they clean. They're called cleaner fish because they, they clean other fish of parasites. Um, lump fish and um, Ballon ras or another species of ras and um, do that job. So again, this was another um, another great idea that the salmon farmers hit on that um, oh, I know what we'll do is we'll we'll introduce thousands of these cleaner fish into these salmon farms and they'll control the sea lice. Um, uh, and that has proven to be, um, as I predicted it would be at the time, an utterly um, um, morally redundant exercise where, um, I am unaware of any other industry in the world which uses um, one species um, as a as a form of disposable medicine for another. Um, so these um, cleaner fish are introduced into salmon farms in their hundreds of thousands, in their millions, um, and they're used um, pretty ineffectively because once the sea lice um, once the sea lice levels go above a certain a certain level, which is a pretty low level, um, cleaner fish are, are all but useless because the the population of sea lice runs out of control. Um, and at the end of every cycle, these hundreds of thousands of cleaner fish are simply killed and thrown away in bins. Um, and they are the most peculiar little fish. They're these bright blue little fish. Um, so when, uh, when you're raking around in bins, as sometimes I do, um, uh, and, and others uh, do, do, do similar work as I do, um, in the big mortality bins, you come across these big, huge containers that are filled with these bright blue little fish, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, and they're used as a disposable medicine, which is, it's just the most ridiculously um, immoral um, use of an animal I think I've ever come across. It's not very effective and it's proven to, to cause just about as many problems um, as it solves because um, shock of, uh, of shocks, intensively breeding um, uh, a small fish like lump fish to solve the problems of intensively breeding another fish just means you get more problems associated with intensively breeding them. So the, the lumpfish and the wrasse particularly um, became vectors for introducing disease into salmon farms um, and had caught they were one of the major issues um, that resulted in uh, well tens and tens of thousands of um, tons of fish dying in 2016 and 2017 um, on salmon farms as a result of disease introduced by cleaner fish. And not only that, but the sea lice adapt to them as well, because as you would expect in a hyper intensive environment, sea lice reproduce every two weeks roughly. Um, so any uh, kind of, it, so natural selection is forced in that kind of intensive environment. So what, what they found in Norway is that cleaner fish are a visual animal, so they need to be able to see the sea lice to, to eat them. Um, so they eat all the sea lice that they can see, but there are sea lice which have a mutation which makes them translucent and see through. Um, but the cleaner fish don't eat them. So what you find is that the sea lice populations become increasingly translucent um, where you have a high use of um, cleaner fish. Um, 
uh, so they become less effective. And you, you see that with every treatment that's ever deployed for sea lice um, very quickly, within about one or two years, the sea lice populations become resistant to it, whether it's a chemical or physical treatment. Yeah, that's awful. Um, the problem spans so much wider than just to the salmon, uh, as you say. Uh, we've got another question from Sue here, and she's asking, what are the salmon fed and where does the feed come from? So this is one of the, the big, the, the biggest, if well, probably the biggest sustainability question. Um, and this is the one issue that supermarkets are actually interested in, in doing something about. Um, so salmon are, are a carnivorous fish, I think that's the right word. They, in the wild, salmon grow by eating other, um, other fish and then also things like um, shrimp and krill um, uh, in the water. And that's where, their, that's where their pink coloring comes from. So in order to make salmon grow, you need to feed them on fish um, and to maintain their health, you need to feed them on fish. So their feed is a, is a manufactured product um, of which a substantial amount um, is derived or contains a substantial amount of fish meal and fish oil, which is derived from um, fish which are wild caught fish, which are caught um, say on the, um, the coast of Peru, for example, where um, hundreds of thousands of tons of um, anchovies are caught. They are then shipped to feed processing plants um, in and around uh, Europe. Um, that they are then processed into salmon feed where, they're, where they are fed to um, farmed salmon. Um, uh, and the most extraordinary thing about that is that um, the, although they're, they are improving on this um, statistic, historically it's taken anything from 10 to 5 kilos of fish being removed from the wild to produce just 1 kilo of farmed salmon. Um, um, that number is reducing, albeit we are entirely reliant on data that comes from salmon farmers um, and the feed industry, um, uh, if they are to be believed. That number is reducing um, such that the industry now claims that every kilo of fish that is removed from the wild, one kilo of fish is produced. Um, but that's a number which is a bit like a, uh, an MPG figure for a car. Um, it doesn't include, for example, if, you, if I have a salmon farm, um, and I rear a hundred fish um, and I feed them um, up to maturity and then just before maturity 99 of them die, um, it doesn't account for the fact that the, the amount of feed that it took to produce that one fish is, is the equivalent to all of the fish that are then being, um, that have had to be thrown away or buried. Um, so uh, that is the biggest sustainability issue. It's one of the reasons that the super is, it's probably the biggest issue that the supermarket, supermarkets are pushing salmon farmers on. Um, but again, that, all that's doing is creating more problems um, because salmon farmers are transitioning to um, uh, plant-based products to feed the fish on, um, which, which creates its own issues. So salmon farmers transition to using soya um, and then, of course, it transpired that they were using Brazilian soya from um, uh, uh, the Amazon region and the supermarkets obviously um, went crazy about that and told them that they had to stop that when it transpired Jai Bolsonaro was burning down large tracts of the, the Amazon rainforest. Um, uh, and then, obviously, um, there are salmon farmers that I've spoken to are, raise issues with, feed, with fish that are fed on high cereal content feed because ultimately the fish are meant to eat fish. And just as if you tried to feed a lion on corn on the cob, um, it'll eat it, but it's, it is not going to do well on it. It's, it's, it's not gonna do as well as it, as it would do eating the things it should eat. So feed is, is one of these big issues which doesn't really affect us directly in Scotland, but is a, is a huge problem. Thank you, Corin. That's a really informative answer and absolutely fascinating. Um, I think because we're running out of time, we'll just leave that there uh, for today. Do you have any online resources or a website, Corin, that you can suggest to everyone watching at home just now to go visit for any further information? Yeah, sure. What I can do is, if, it, if it's useful, is I can just throw a few links into the chat here. Is that is that the easiest thing to do? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the first one is a link to the, my Facebook page, the, the campaign Facebook page, which is really where you'll find uh, a constant stream of news, virtually daily news and campaign material. There's, there's so much stuff that you can get into um, and dig around in. Um, that's a good source of, of, of information. I, I do have a website, but it's, it's pretty static. Um, 
Uh, but if you want to refer people to it, that's the link for that. Um, if anyone wants to explore the footage that I've shared tonight, um, feel free. There's a Google folder um, which has most of um, most of the footage and images in there, um, and you can you can view that at your leisure. Um, lastly, or oh, nearly lastly, um, if anyone's really interested in detail of all this stuff and how the regulation works um, or doesn't work. Um, uh, I wrote a, a long, a very long report, which um, took me about a year to write, which looked at the, the salmon farm where I filmed undercover and underwater. Um, I did a, a long, a long uh, freedom of information investigation into that farm and exactly what happened and how it, how it was allowed to get into that state, um, which actually revealed um, a lot of, um, uh, I don't think how best to describe this dodgy dealings between the government or government agencies and the salmon farm operator where um, for example the uh, the the agency that was is responsible for inspecting it for welfare and also fish health and um, after I'd alerted them to the issues and um, they actually pre-warned the operator three days in advance that they were going to come and do an inspection and um, I found that through um, an investigation into uh, phone calls that had been exchanged between the offices um, of the, the, the fish health inspectorate and the salmon farming company. Um, so there's a lot of detail in there if you want to get into that. Um, and lastly, if you'd like to help me out on one of my current campaigns, which is not a, a welfare focused campaign, but um, it's about salmon farming. Um, recently, it was discovered that salmon farming companies have been um, using large amounts of formaldehyde um, in freshwater locks where juvenile where they raise their juvenile salmon before they're put out to sea um, uh, many many tons of formaldehyde in one case in Loch Lochy near Fort William um, 11 tons of formaldehyde was uh, was dumped into this loch to treat farm salmon um, uh, and there's obviously a lot of concerns around that because formaldehyde is a, a, a chemical which was only recently listed in 2016 as um, being a cancer causing chemical by um, UK agencies so we're running a petition to, um, to get that stopped. Um, and we've already got, I think, 8,000 or so signatures. Um, but we're going for 10,000 signatures and then um, I can take it up with the minister. Um, so if you'd like to sign that petition, the, the link is in there. It's only open to, um, to people in the UK, unfortunately. Um, but that would, be, that would be a great help. But otherwise, if you want to get in touch, get in touch with me via the Facebook page. Um, and there's always plenty going on. So um, I'll be happy to, happy to chat to you and, and let you know what's happening.